Let me mention a few other things, that the, more, more of an incidental nature. The construction you see going on the campus is a reflection of the strategic plan, whether it's the uh, new humanities building, the, the two or really three new uh, colleges, uh, the total uh, redo, gutting and redoing of uh, the chemistry building now, bioscience and bioengineering, uh, the the construction of uh, the uh, new business school, which is across from the Baker Institute, and incidentally, and finally, that we're working on the library, and we got a ways to go with that. It'll be the most expensive project Rice has ever done, um, but I think it'll be maybe the most exciting project Rice has ever done. Uh, but under under the uh, under the business school, for the first time, is underground parking. And when we first start talking about that, we look out over these empty spaces and you wonder, why are you doing this? But every time I come out here, it's like tonight, I, Peggy and I were looking at the number of cars near the music school over there. This place is getting crowded and crowded and more crowded. So I think we'll be doing a lot more of that. It's terribly expensive. It's, it's I won't say prohibitory, but it's very expensive. And the only way to rationalize it, as I do, is that you're really buying new land when you go under because it's land you wouldn't otherwise have. So, Also, we're told, and you can believe this or not, that it pays out over a period of time. That assumes a lot of things, that I might add. But uh, otherwise, we're going to be like the medical center in very short order, and I don't think anybody wants to do that. Uh, uh, what else are we going to do besides these buildings? Well, we need a convocation center, you know, in Madeleine Albright or Nelson Mandela. Come, we really don't have a very good place. And I think we need a student life building. Uh, Dick Stabell has been telling me that for years, that we're disadvantaged competing for the best students because kids today, among other things, like to work out. And they, need, they need good facilities, and it'll be expensive. It's just a matter of money. So if any of y'all would like to donate a student life building, you're... But a, another thing, that, and this gets into the a terribly important subject, I think. I'll do it briefly, and that is Rice's relationship to the community. I think Malcolm Gillis really deserves primary credit, but Rice is collaborating more with other places today than its entire history put together. We have around 70 joint ventures with the medical, I mean major joint ventures with the medical center institutions, for example. We don't build a laboratory without checking to see if they have one that'll do in some joint venture so we won't build in redundancy. You cannot afford to do otherwise. Uh, the Baker Institute has been a source. The business school has been a source of all this. And it's part of an effort, which is in our strategic plan, incidentally, to reach out. If you, if you took every living Rice graduate and you put them in Rice Stadium, it'd be about half full. And that's not enough. I tell you, we have to reach out to a broader constituency to have people adopt Rice, uh, really, is what it amounts to. Uh, another angle has been, uh, well, when, when Malcolm became president in his inaugural address, he said Rice would either become international or become irrelevant. And I don't think we're going to be irrelevant. Uh, there are a lot of steps that have been done. Of course, the Baker Institute is a piece of this. Radical increase in the study abroad program is a piece of this. The, the new language center, the study of cultures is a piece, is a piece of this. The work with the... Uh, International University of Bremen, Germany, is, is an incidental piece of this. Uh, and I think the board itself uh, is, is a, we're getting a more of an international view on our board. And I'm, I'm not an internationalist, so I mean, I, you really, for example, the last, uh, three, last, take three out of four last trustees came on the board. One of them is in charge of Exxon Mobil's operations worldwide and all the production and development they have. I called him in the month of April about coming on the board, and it, that year he'd already been to 22 countries outside of the United States. Steve Miller, uh, president of Shell Oil, uh, has lived abroad most of his life. I mean, he's lived all over the world. 
Albert Chow, whose uh, family has uh, petrochemical and plastic facilities in Malaysia, Taiwan, as well as the United States. All of these people have, have been very contributing in, 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 on international issues and things we ought to be doing and how we ought to do them. Uh, the last thing I would say is where do we go from here? And I think it's um, where do, what else should we be doing? And how do we do it? And I think one thing that I would emphasize is Rice as an undergraduate school I think is as good as anywhere in the country. I don't think there is a better undergraduate school. George Rupp, when he was president, used to say that Princeton and Rice were the two best undergraduate schools in the country. He was a Princeton guy, of course. Uh, um, I asked one of our trustees who was very involved at Stanford, and he compared, and they said, well, they have a great medical school, you don't have one. They have a great law school, you don't have one. They have this, they have that. He said, of course, the Rice undergraduate is better. Uh, what we really, I think, are emphasizing more and more are trying to find areas where we can be preeminent. We have emphasized nanoscale science and technology, computer computational engineering, uh, uh, biosciences and bioengineering, and, and we, a few others. For example, the architecture school is well regarded, the music school. Something I would, I think I'd have opposed if I'd been on the board thinking it just didn't fit Rice. I just love now. I just think it's a great thing. It, it's getting very good. But not everything is at that level. And I think we need to be emphasizing through faculty changes, through, through renewed focus in different areas, such as Southern history, uh, which Dr. Bowles area is probably the best you could find. Uh, things like that to make sure that whatever it is we're doing, uh, we're, we're, we're doing an awfully good job on it. So you go back, it's kind of interesting when you talk of, of William Marsh's Rice's vision. And it's funny, I'd say it's, it's, there's almost nothing left in the charter. And yet, the vision of, of he had of high quality, small, a bent toward the sciences, but not just that. With a little tinkering by people like Edgar O'Dell Lovett, uh, it's come out, it, it, it's, it would still be recognizable. It's affordable. Mr. Rice had a phrase that Rice was for the benefit of determined youth of slender means. And, and, it, and hopefully we're still doing that. And uh, so in a way, you see the vision of the founder with major modifications here today. And so I think that's kind of nice. I don't, I don't think the original trustees betrayed his vision at all, really. They just ooched it up a little bit. And I think the same things are occurring today. Well, those are the main points I want to to cover, but uh, I'd be delighted. Uh, y'all y'all haven't asked me any questions, any questions. So. That's what, that's what happens when you, when you cover obscure history. People don't know enough to ask questions about it. Yeah? Could you tell us a little bit about Captain Baker, who he was, what he was like, why he was called Captain, all these things? Yeah. He's sort of a mystery figure. Yeah, I, know, I, know, I happen to know a little bit about him uh, because uh, I'm, I'm with the Baker Boss firm. Uh, Incidentally, that people say yeah, he's the founder of the firm. Actually, he's not. The firm started in 1840. He, he moved, his father moved to Houston in 1872 from Huntsville, just like Judge Elkins did with the Vincent Elkins firm later, moved from Huntsville. Everything comes from Huntsville for some reason. Uh, judge Baker was a, a judge, and uh, he, I don't think he lived too long after coming down here. Uh, his son, uh, was named Captain Baker, not because he was a great war hero, but because there was some local outfit, kind of a military thing, uh, that, that he was captain of. So they called him that. It's not a very, it's, you wouldn't want to explain that all the time, I don't think. Uh, but he was a very broad gauge guy. He, uh, Joe Pratt, who is a historian, uh, Rice graduate, teaches at the University of Houston now, wrote the history of what was then Texas Commerce Bank, wrote a history for us, 
wrote a history of the Brown brothers. He, he, he really knows Houston pretty well. He thinks Captain Baker may have been the most significant figure in the history of Houston. He was involved in starting several banks, a number of businesses. He was chairman of the board of Rice for 50 years. Think about that. I told Charles Duncan he's a piker. He'd been there 14 years. You know, George Brown was chairman for 18 years, but 50. Uh, I'm sure when he died, a change was needed. You know, at that time he was pretty old. But he was a. Uh, I know in the firm when there were big fights, he was always the peacemaker because he could kind of tell people what to do, and uh, that, that was that was kind of necessary. Uh, Jim Baker and uh, his cousin Preston Moore tell the story of going over to, you know where, you know where the uh, old Bland Cadillac place was down on Gray? Well, well, his home, which was called Seven Oaks, was in that, just sort of catty corner across the street, there. I don't know what's there now. And uh, he used to have a big house there, and uh, they tell this. They, he apparently a pretty forbidding character. They, they were, they were, they thought he was tough. Uh, the two uh, grandsons, and uh, but he was, a, he was, a, he was, a, he was quite a guy. Apparently, uh, he he was, he was very involved all over the country with different different organizations and things. And in those days, that was unusual. Uh, but. Uh, Rice was a big part of his life as he got into it. And, uh, I may not have answered your question. That's about all I know. So, it, uh, anybody else? Mr. Barnett. Yeah. Um, I was curious about the library. You said it's one of the, it's the most expensive project we've ever done, and given that we've. Yeah, we now, we're way, we, we may be a little ways away because i tell you what we've gone through, and I don't mean to give away any secrets in this thing, but uh, we hired a world-famous architect, and we didn't give him enough guidance. He came up with something that wouldn't work, really. So we backed off. We didn't have the money anyway, so it didn't make any difference. But, uh, <laughs> but what we decided was we were going to have to make a lot of big decisions about it. These have not all been made yet, but, for example, we, were, we, we planned to sort of renovate the building. We're about to give up on that, I think. There's a question of uh, how much can you put underground, like a lot of libraries are doing today. There's a question, are there books that are used every five years that we can have within a couple hours, but in a remote location, so as we don't have to use that, 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 that space. But the most exciting thing about the library and the most startling thing to me it relates to a lunch I had years ago. Chuck Henry is a new librarian, and he, he's, he's, he's been a big plus, I, I can just tell you. And we hired this New York for, for sort of planning purposes, a New York uh, set of architects that have worked on just about every new library in the country. And I remember going, and they said, well, look, this is going to be different. A library is still a place where you do research, but that's, 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 that's just a part of it now. It's a gathering place for people doing serious work, sort of a gathering, intellectual gathering place. And you're going to have, you're going to have enormous amount of computer type stuff in there. You're going to have, and he said, you know, he said now, by the way, you've got to have food. These, these people like to eat when they're doing all this work. And, I said, food? He said, yeah, you got to have food. And uh, uh, it, was, it was very interesting because Chuck Henry said, he said, you know when you go in a library and the first person you meet is the dumbest person in the library, doesn't know anything, but down in the bowels of the library is somebody that knows everything? He said, we're going to turn that upside down. We'll have 10 people like that one, and they'll be the first person you meet because it's a service entity now. And what a good librarian can do for you today is fabulous. I mean, it is unbelievable. So I, I can't explain it very well, but it, it's a library that they think will be the prototype for the library of the future. More specifically, I have always thought that a huge disadvantage of Rice was because it was so small, it couldn't afford the kind of library you need with a first-class university. 
Okay? Now, and also that it was put in the wrong place. Now they say, no, it's in the just the right place. And uh, you've got the perfect situation. Yale's annual cost is $50 million, for example, to maintain their library. We'll have most of all that stuff online. Uh, now, it, it sounds almost too good to be true, other than the cost. Uh, but when we get through, it, it should be a, a fabulous addition and probably as important as anything this university could, could have as a, as a great, you know, really good library. But it'll be one that'll be copied. The new architect we're working with is a very exciting guy. He, he's really, in fact, he taught at Rice years ago. But, uh, but I, I'm, I'm very, I'm extremely encouraged over it. And we, we, we are a little short of the mark financially, I'll say. Could you talk a little bit about the Convocation Center? Well, you know, Convocation Center is a funny word. Convocation Center is a funny phrase. I mean, it's all in the eye of the beholder. I mean, what, what do you, you know, some people say it's, it's, it's an auditorium. Some people say it's a stage you can put on, you can put on dramatic productions. Some people say it's a basketball court. Some people say it's this. Some people say it's a, it's a meeting place. Some people say, well, it's all of it. We're going to put it all together. You can also separate it. So, but, but the, uh, John, I don't think there's a great faculty meeting place, is it, Rice? I, I mean, you, just fundamental things like that. To say nothing of uh, Nelson Mandela occasion or things that the Baker Institute's putting on routine. They don't, Baker Institute doesn't have a place for all this stuff. Uh, there, there are a lot of things that could be, Mary, but I, but, and, and, and I, I think when we, we had a retreat on the solitary board retreat about a year and a half ago just on the campus. Everybody's afraid of losing green space and, you know, all that stuff. And, uh, uh, the subject of a convocation center came up, and, and there are obviously different ways you can do it. So, could even have continuing education there, I guess. You know, that, uh, yeah, I thought you might be. At, uh, but that, it's, uh, it's kind of like a, what's a student life building, you know, or whatever you call it. Uh, it it's, you can fold into it more or less what you want or what you can afford. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you, 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 you probably didn't ask that to the best person in the world to answer that question. I'm, I'm not uh, very sophisticated in that area to put it as mildly as I can. Uh, but I think the, the, the challenges that, that Rice, at Rice run along these lines, first of all, uh, you know, we, 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 we have made some effort to teach teachers how to teach using the latest stuff. And I think the challenge is not to just do better what you're already doing, but to do what you're doing totally differently. You know, that which, uh, there is a proposal now, goes under the name I, the letter I, Rice, that includes, as I understand it, we'll be including a lot of things that could transform much of what we do here. And I'm not talking about distance learning yet. Uh, at all, but but just the way we do what we do, and there I know there are some very aggressive uh, proposals made to potential donors. To, it's very expensive stuff. Uh, the library will involve much of that. The library will really be be advanced in that sense, and I'm sure whatever we do, we we'll look back and say we didn't do it very. We know we could have done it a lot better, but at least it's going to be a start. Distance learning, uh, we are working on. We're collaborating with other universities, feeling our way along as truth be known uh, in how to, how to do it and what, what will be the right thing. I don't think any of us believe that the role of the school with the small classes and the give and take with teachers and good students will ever go away. At least I hope not. But 
realistically, there are going to be a lot of people sitting at home with a computer who would like to be taking these great courses. I listen to these tapes in my car, these teaching company tapes, you know, and if they're not too complicated. And uh, I think with all the technology available now, you know, you're going to have great distance learning. We are not participating in that much at this stage, We're trying to figure out how to do it more. Yeah. I suspect the, that's exactly right. Uh, I think what, what I was getting at toward the a few minutes ago, uh, I think achieving preeminence in those areas is going to carry with it substantial increase in the graduate school, as I see it. Right now, what's, what are the numbers? 2,600 undergraduate and 14 to 1,500 graduate. Uh, I would guess both would grow. The, the, the strategic plan calls for very slow growth of the undergraduate school. You know, it could go a little faster, but I think the graduate school will definitely, the graduate programs will definitely grow, and uh, I don't know how fast, but I guess faster than the, good, good bit faster than the undergraduate. Uh, I, th I, think, I think we need a, a more substantial graduate program. But having said that, that's, I'd be unable to put much meat on those bones, I think, for you. But it, it's, it's, uh, it's exciting. You know, I think there are a lot of things we could do. I think you want to you guess right, though, when you invest in a new area. You want to do it right. And uh, I think we've been lucky with the nanoscale and the computational engineering and the bio side. I think all that's working very well. But very competitive. And I'll tell you, the uh, antitrust suit justice brought against the Eastern, the Ivy League schools, they used to agree on what, everything. And you could, as long as they were all doing exactly alike, you could cheat. You could go under them. You could do different. Now they're, they're throwing money at everything. The competition for the best students is just awful. It is just, I guess if you're a student, it's great. But, it, but it, it's really competitive. And we're trying to find ways to, to uh, compete effectively in that. But it's a, uh, higher education is a rapidly moving situation, boy. Yeah. You mentioned Kevin Baker and uh, a couple other folks. Are there other people who you think, as individuals, have had a major influence on the course of the university? For example, uh, George Brown or... I don't think there's any question but that George Brown had a major influence on this university. I barely knew George Brown, frankly. Uh, in fact, I was always on the other side of litigation, Brown and Root. But, um, but he was a, uh, you know, he, he's, he, was, he was chairman 18 years. And I think he and Ken uh, uh, Pitzer, the president, probably responsible for the uh, lawsuit, which was absolutely essential. But, but a close call, we, almost, we could have lost that case to desegregate the university. Uh, he, uh, he did a lot. For example, and I, I don't think this is talking out of school, I know when Charles Duncan was Secretary of uh, Energy, he said, came down and Brown said, I want to see you. And he said, I want to see three things. I want this, this, and you've got to get more interested in rice. And he wanted a commitment on the spot, you know. <laughs> I mean, he, he was an effective operator. And uh, John Bowles, you might have other ideas of other people. I think Brown has clearly had a big impact on Rice. I think Kenneth Pitcher, uh, but, Pitcher of course, worked closely with Brown. Yeah. Interesting. 
says you should have a, a graduate school of uh, business. You should begin to develop professional schools. Under Fincher was the first real fundraising campaign. So I think it is really, in some sense, the same way that Lovett yeah. totally expanded the, the, you know, the rights to you. I think Fincher, working with Brown, sort of in some sense kind of created the modern rights with graduate programs, with strength <coughs> across the board, with fundraising, with professional schools. So I think Fincher was extremely important. And, and a brief, w w despite his brief tenure. Right. Yeah. You know, your question, though, your question is, I think, really on point because, to me, if you, as I said in the beginning, if you look at Rice, if you look at the history of Rice, individuals provided leadership and an expanded vision. Pitzer was clearly one of those people. And that is what has made the difference, I, I, re I really believe. You take, for example, the, uh, the business school today. I suppose it's common knowledge. Business school is going through a huge change, all for the good, in my opinion. And it has leadership of a very strong dean. And, 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 and I think that has, uh, look at the music school, look at Michael Hammond, you know, it's a big difference. Uh, you, you can see it across the board. Uh, it's, it's no secret how, how institutions succeed. You know, they have people come forward. I think Malcolm Gillis has done a great deal at Rice since he came here. So, I'm sure there are others, um, there, there, there are any number of other people who, who have done a great deal, I think. Uh, but um, there have been lulls, you know, at time, and you, you, can, you can, when you go through the history, you can feel it. That, uh, it's sort of holding, holding, but not much, not too much. Yeah. Well, you know, the, uh, the, the business of uh, Rice being a trust, if it is, has hampered change because it has, you have had to go to court under some fancy legal theory to excuse what you've done. And, uh, for example, the so-called, what, what the theory and the reason uh, in, in, the, in the desegregation case, for example, that was, it's a difficult legal theory. You've got to show that of all the purposes that the founder had, the dominant one was to be a first-class university. That's why what we were talking about earlier is important and why the finding of that court was so important. That they, I don't know how they got the court to do that. They did. Uh, and, and you've got to show that the subsidiary purpose, free, no debt, segregation, all that, would frustrate the main purpose. And that's the whole, that's the whole theory of it. Uh, now, that we, we, we've gone, there's not much left in the charter to get in the way, I don't think. So I don't think we're hampered in that way. Uh, I thought of trying to go and get a, get a blank check for future ch changes, but I, I decided not to do that. <laughs> Probably couldn't have gotten it. But. Will there be yeah, oh, the competition is horrible. I don't know if you've read things Princeton is doing on, on recruiting uh, undergraduate students and graduate students both. They're paying them to come. I mean, it, it is, it's great if you're a hot student, you know, but it, uh, it is really expensive. And we've been coming up with different ways. We had a, we had a board retreat uh, just a few months ago on the sole subject. What triggered it was this question. What can we do so that more of the people we turn out in whatever field they go into become leaders? That was sort of the touchstone of this thing. And uh, we went all through it, and how do you develop leadership? And, you know, we would take these applications and break into small groups and see which one, what, well, who did your group admit, you know, who did your group? Interestingly, of those who have applied, there wasn't a lot of disagreement. The disagreement came, how do we attract those who did not apply or rejected us? How do we, what do we do for those we take in to make them better leaders when they get out? 
And as you, as you, as you I'm sure you appreciate, that's a very funny, dicey area, but it's a terribly important area. So competing for students and doing the best you can by them once they get here is a huge challenge. The technology is a huge challenge. The cost of everything is a huge challenge. We're building a lot of buildings now, and I'm, I'm convinced they're, they're necessary. But the costs are going to go way up. We persuaded one guy. One guy was going to another. He was being offered a lot of stuff. He's going to another university and scientific area and persuading him not to go. He wasn't asking for much, but he said, I'll tell you, if we succeed in what we're doing, and it gets back to the development of these graduate school programs, it's going to cost you a lot more because then we're going to have to really build up. And that's what's going to be happening. Every success leads to more challenges. And you can see it coming down, you know, coming all the time. Uh, but it's very expensive. We're competing. Rice, at the end of World War II, and, and again, I'm relying on John Bowles. Rice was a good regional undergraduate school. It was not a university, certainly not a national research university by any stretch of the imagination. So it's come fast. You know, it really has come fast. Consider this. From the time of the charter, from the time Rice first opened its doors until World War II, there, were, there, were, there was a World War and a Great Depression. And then another world war. So until you get into the 50s, Rice really had had a hard, hard early life and uh, didn't have much money. But it's, um, that's why the things, these strategic plans and the fundraising is so important because competition is, is horrendous. For example, we got a head start in nanoscale science. I read somewhere Harvard said, well, we want to get into that. We'll put two, three million, hundred million dollars into that. They've got so much money, approaching $20 billion in their endowment. So, it, uh, so it's not easy. But uh, we, on the other hand, we have, a huge, we have some huge advantages. Size is an advantage. The collegial, collaborative atmosphere on the campus is a big advantage, I think. Yeah. You bet. You bet. I mean, it's getting, it's getting, it is, it is, seems to me it's getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, and the more successful you are, the more good faculty you have, the worse they're going to be solicited. And uh, the interesting thing about it, usually it's, it's really not salary that's the problem. It, it's, um, well, before uh, Rick Smalley and Bob Curl ever got the Nobel Prize, uh, Curl was recruited. I think it was Princeton and Berkeley. Uh, they thought they had him. And the only way we kept him was committing to build a huge new facility for nanoscale science, something most of us, I, I've read two books. I don't, I don't have a clue what it's about. You know, it, I've been through the lab a lot. It, uh, it's just over my head. Uh, but, you, but it's that sort of decision right or wrong that, that, that holds faculty. No, it's, get, it's really bad. And we went, we do, we do pretty well because people like the school, like the atmosphere, but, but it's not easy. Yeah. I mean, without getting much bigger? I think the, according to their, their strategic plan, which is the latest thing, the undergraduate will grow at a very slow rate. The graduate will grow faster. Now that a strategic plan is never set in stone. It changes all the time. So you know we, we, we could be looking at some changes. But, but basically, Rice is never going to be a big university. We, we can't afford it. You know, it's just, just that simple. 
And I think it's real advantages to being small. There's some disadvantages too, but it, uh, yeah. Well, it seems like you're expanding. Yeah, but you know, it, that, that not, not so much, for example, in the undergraduate school, uh, that doesn't change anything. For example, I, I was very proud of the fact that after our guys, two guys got the Nobel Prize, and the next year, one of them taught freshman chemistry and one of them had the laboratory for freshman chemistry. Pretty good introduction for 18-year-olds at that point. And, and much of this is graduate. I, 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 think, I don't think it's going to really require the expansion. I keep asking, what are we going to do with all these buildings we're putting up here? <laughs> the business school, for example, will grow. It's going to double in size. It has to, it has to, to compete. It would still be a small business school, but it's below, below par earlier. Mary, I think that seems to be it. Thank you.